It's Friday. We're gonna go ahead on and talk to some talk to a uh, icon in film and everything. And there she is, right there. I'm gonna go ahead and get you joined. Hey, good evening to you. Can you see me good? I can see you great. You look great. You got a great background and everything. Can you see and hear me okay? Absolutely. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Good evening. I am Al. I work here nice. with Plastic Magazine. We call it Plastic because we're Plastique. fancy. Yes, I've been corrected. Plastic. Plastic. We're fancy around these parts and everything. So welcome to uh, you know, to Friday and all of that stuff like that. I've been looking forward to hanging out with you and and and, and I've had a chance to read over some of your stuff. So I'm very excited. Uh, about just having a chance to chat with you and all that stuff like that. Before we jump into everything like that, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Al. You know, life is good. I don't really have much to complain about. I, I love seeing what's happening. You know, you can without change, nothing can happen, right? So we absolutely shaking up. I'm with it. I'm with whatever way it goes. If we don't, if I don't even go back to work this year, I'm okay with that because you you need something drastic to happen, right? So I'm excited. I feel like I'm living in my own civil rights movement. We have our own version of our civil rights right now. We, we, we read about it in history books. We had exactly. our, our great parents and ancestors mm -hmm. tell us about it. But right now, we're living in our own uh, paradigm of that. And it's, it's interesting. And it's an interesting time. But let's jump into that. We got, so I want to definitely talk about that. So let's go ahead and jump into it right now. So here at Plastique, as I said, we like to put on these different live events and bring people together to kind of create a safe space where people can release the tensions of the day or the work week with so much going on in the world, as we were just saying, we like to find different ways in which we can highlight the people and events that make us smile and you create events that make people smile. So welcome, uh, first and foremost there. Thank Happy you. Juneteenth. Uh, yes. It is a very powerful day. I'm speaking with a very powerful individual. And as we celebrate and remember those that came before us, we need to highlight someone that has been giving us excellence in real time. Uh, you know, I am honored uh, to be speaking with one of our magical cornerstones about the life journey and what lies ahead. Angela, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Great opening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good. you. Good to be here. Good. We're happy to have you. All right. So before we start talking about all of the amazing things that you've accomplished and your current projects, I, and, and of course, you know, your journey towards purpose, you, you are an attorney. Uh, you, have, you have a lot going on. You're, you're an attorney. You've got various degrees, you know, from your BA, your master's, all these things. So obviously academics has been a big part of your life. Are you from a family of academics, you know, or did you, are you just one of those people that has a hunger for knowledge? Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm definitely from a family of academics. I understand the moment we're in right now because my parents went through a lot to get their degrees. So I'm not the first, I'm not, I don't have the same story as a lot of people. A lot of people, they're the first generation to accomplish certain things. I'm not the first to do anything in my family. So the expectation was you're supposed to. Right. And that of my life like it's just this is what we're supposed to do they fought died and crawled and screamed to get us to this point right so we right. have a, to pay it forward to other people and um i always knew that i have to have excellence because we're always treated second class anyway so we we have to push ourselves gotcha so you come from a family of academics who uh, basically you you really didn't have much of a choice but it also sounds as though you were going to kind of go that path anyway, just because when you're around those types of people and you're inspired by that, obviously that's the type of uh, fruit that's going to be bare with that. So I totally understand. Now, once you became an attorney, you took a very unique path. Um, you know, you started working with entertainers and kind of managing their career trajectory. Now, have you always had a passion for the entertainment industry or, you know, I mean, because let's be honest, you had the credentials, you know, to go into any vertical and, and make an impact. What drew you to the entertainment industry and something so unpredictable? Well, for me, that's my whole life. A lot of people don't know that. I'm a trained pianist. I was playing. My mom's an opera singer. I was playing in the clubs when I was 15, 16, played for my church till 18. I didn't know anything but entertainment. Where I'm from, Teaneck, New Jersey, is an entertainment town. We're right, offside, right outside the Bronx and then Harlem. So that's all I knew. Even when I was in college, I was bringing entertainers to college to do, you know, with the Black Student Union, to do concerts. So my love was always there. I couldn't see myself in anything else. 
Okay. All right. So that, that makes sense. Because I was just like, hmm, how did she pivot, you know, from all of that? And you could have went anywhere and, and, and pretty much been able to make an impact. But she went into the entertainment industry, which I thought was interesting. Now, how did you even have time to keep up with any TV shows or music, even though it, it sounds like you had a passion for it? You, you have a lot of degrees. And these are degrees that you have to spend an enormous of time studying and, and, and putting energy into. Where did you carve out the time to listen to music and stay up to date between studying and writing papers for so many years? Yeah, so for me, for my bachelor's, I was part of Black Student Union. So we entertainment was important to us. You know, when, you, when I went to a white university, so for us to bring Black entertainment was huge. Huge, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we were close to Dell State and Lincoln University, but we still were our own little island. So for me, you know, that was just always a component. When I went to graduate school, I worked at the New York Times during the day. So I went to graduate school at night. And even at the New York Times, I was like, oh, this is really what I want to do. And then when I attended law school, that's when I started interning for Universal Music Group that really changed the trajectory of my life where I knew this is the only thing I was going to do. So I started interning on Def Comedy Jam. Then I worked on the Chris Rock show. And then that's what landed me here in L.A. 20 years ago. So th th this was directed. This was strategic. Even to go to law school was strategic. I met a lot of black professionals back then who were like, you're not going to go far with what you got. <laughs> and I wasn't going to lay on my back. So I knew I had to have some weapons. And so right. the law degree was the weapon. One of the first people I interned for was Lundell McMillan. During I, the time I'm, I'm familiar with Lundell. To get out of his contract. So I was around a lot of mentors. Sylvia Rohn used to mentor me. Suzanne DePass. Wow. People who were like, you have to stack the deck. So when I went to law school, it was never to practice law. It was just to have it because I knew I needed it. Mm, wow. And you and so you were basically mentored by some yeah. huge uh, icons there that you just named. So, wow, huge blessing. So now it, it makes sense that you were able to kind of turn around and, and be just as successful uh, as some of them. So that that's interesting. Now, you kind of cut your teeth, at least based upon the bio there. Uh, managing comedians and eventually, you know, producing comedy shows and such like that uh, for a network. So what are some of the lessons uh, that inspired you to eventually start directing films? Like, how did you go from, you know, doing the comedy shows and, you know, kind of working, you know, in different aspects of music to where you said, hmm, I want to direct films because I don't have enough on my plate right now. <laughs> the journey out everything so even when i was a talent manager again there's always people that come in your life that direct you whether they're there for a short period of time or a long period so there was people along the journey who was like talent management is not where it's at just like people told me law wasn't where it was at so then i started producing and then after producing for a while people were like that's not where it's at you just can't be a producer you have to be able to offer more so then that's how i got into directing last year my first two projects so it's always a growth period. Everything we do in life, we have to elevate. And we can't stay static at anything. So I think for me, it's always recognize. I don't want to be not relevant. I don't want to be a dinosaur. So the way you have to adapt is what? When you see things change, you got to pivot and get with it. All right. Hey, I, I got that. Okay. So you, you just mentioned, uh, you know, about some projects and stuff. Can you tell us about your current project, uh, Hands Up, it Hands Up, and how, you know, the impact of slavery is still felt today? But first and foremost, if you could tell us about the project and then, you know, kind of get into, you know, how it, you know, impacts today. Yeah. So Hands Up was done with my school, Backstage Pass to the Movie Industry. We shot that in Atlanta last November. And we did that as a short film, as another avenue to for me to direct. We shot it on an actual plantation. It was inspired by a young teenager at 16 years old. And then we had somebody else, a black man write it. So it was a black man that inspired it at 16. Then another young black man who wrote it. And it was like a love letter for me to black men about what's happening in this country. We also work with the NWCP and Urban League to help with some of the financing and just to help push us along. We had a lot of problems. To the state of Georgia, in different ways, was fighting us. Really? Uh, yeah, they thought I was part of the, which is funny, the Black Lives Movement. That's what they thought I was a part of, which is hilarious now, um, eight months later, right? Right. 
And um, so we had to unfortunately get legal involved at some places because a lot of people don't realize these plantations are still owned by their original families. Mm -hmm. Not what you think. The original families that own it. Doesn't matter if it's the great great grandson. These are original direct lines. And so a lot of them were really concerned about the content that we were shooting. I had one plantation owner tell me, You can't have anything good in this script. Well, there's nothing good that happened at the plantation. <laughs> right, right. I'm confused. So we had a lot of battles, but it's probably my best piece of work. We basically take you from 1855 to the eyes of a young boy all the way to 2020. All the actors play two roles. So, for example, if you're the master of the plantation, you're the chief of police in 2020. So it's very good. It's just showing how time has evolved, but not much has changed. Wow. That sounds amazing. And now, now is that project already out or coming? No finishing up. I'm hoping we'll be able to unrelease the trailer in the next week or two weeks. And uh, people are interested. They want to see it. And then we want to turn it out into a feature film. So God willing, we'll also get the financing or the distributor that will let us really take it, blow it out. We show the peace shows one day to this family of them being on the run. Just one day between 1855 and 2020. And you have to see it to see what has changed. Wow, that, that just sounds amazing. I, I can't wait to see that because that just, that really sounds amazing yeah. um, in terms of putting that, especially with everything that's kind of going on today. Now, I was, it, it kind of leads me into the next question. Everyone always remembers their first project. Now, can you tell me about your first film project? And I was, and it sounds like you had some challenges with that, but I was going to ask you about your challenges with your first film project. Yeah, so I've done a lot. So the very first thing I ever did was with Showtime. Showtime back in the day in 2001 had the Showtime Black Filmmakers Foundation. So the very first project I did is where the cast members of Soul Food each got a grant, a directorial grant, the three of them elected to take it. And we had a lot of challenges. I didn't even know what I was doing. I didn't understand what the producer was. You got to understand something. When I moved here from New Jersey to Los Angeles, I really never met really film producers. Before that, I went to what was called the Acapulco Black Film Festival. And I met Tracy Evans. And Tracy said, if you ever come to LA, look me up. So I'm, at that time, used to work in New York. If you tell me that, I'm looking you up. That's an invitation. <laughs> That's what it meant to me. God willing, yeah. she accepted it. And so I had a little office there under my mentor at the time um, for two years at Edmonds Entertainment. Everybody's like, well, how'd you get up here? I said, I met her at ABSF. And she told me, look her up. Wow. Amazing. I was, yeah, so I had done a couple of projects there because at the time she had a deal with Showtime and um, Fox and um, those early projects were challenging because I didn't know what I was doing. Not a clue. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and just once again, I think it, it goes, I'm sorry, right. <laughs> you fake it till you make it and then you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm with you. No, but it's interesting because I, it goes back to what you said a little bit earlier about your path being guided. It's like each time you were in different situations, you met other key uh, icons that were already working, uh, people of color who were already powerful and established, who were able to mentor and help you, uh, and you continue to keep meeting that. So it's obviously you know, very purpose-driven uh, in terms of that and, and a blessing that you were able to meet those different people. And, and of course, nothing's by coincidence because you're here today and you've been able to do so much as a result of it. So that's, uh, that's amazing. It's about, I'd love to hear about people's journey. Uh, in terms of that, it's always very inspiring. Um, on that too, I, I tell people too, it's never by luck or chance. It's about the work you put into it, okay? So when I was working my butt off in New York before I came to LA, I think the momentum goes with you. So when people say, I can't meet anybody, I can't, well, what are you doing? Are you sitting at home trying to meet people? Or are you out here hustling? Right. Hey, sorry, I had to say something. Sorry, somebody knows me from home, home. But it's like you have to be out here hustling. I was hustling in high school. Right. But that has to be in you, Al. You know, you just can't. It's just because energy attracts energy. Right. It does. So, it does. Right. You can be in the same room with somebody. They don't meet nobody. Somebody else can be in the same room and meet the right person. Hey, I'm not even going to touch that because I agree with it 1 million percent. Very well said. So in that particular vein, 
Um, and hey, everybody in the chat there, you guys, we, we love it. We love it. Thank you. Hey, Ke Keisha's sister. <laughs> this so, is Keisha was my roommate in college. She used to protest with me. We used to do sit-ins, like the real deal. So I just love you, Joyce. Hey, Joyce. Shout out to you. Shout out to everybody in the chat. We got uh, Marie out there. We've got what ch it's a ch Chocolate Three Goddess 90. Wow. That's that. I love that name. It, 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 magic. I love it. Let's see who else we got in the chat. We got uh, God Grace, uh, God Grace in Motion. Love that name, beautiful name. Uh, Maurice Scott, what's up to you, bro? And always have uh, Mama of four boys. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm my wife's a mother of five. I love it. So you know, shout out to y'all in there. And here's Kirby. Kirby is the uh, reason why we're having this conversation today. Shout out to Kirby and everything <laughs> that she's doing. <laughs> All right, so. We were talking about inspiration. So yeah. inspiration, what inspired you to start your own multimedia entertainment company rather than to partner uh, with a major since you were already a proven commodity within the industry? Well, I started my company in 97 as a management company, event promotion. I was doing comedy shows in New York. You know, like I said, I was hustling. And so... When I moved out here, I didn't know anything else but to work for myself. I partner with people all the time to this day, but I don't know anything else but working for myself. And that's the only reason why you really can't go anywhere in life if you don't own the property. You're always going to be working for somebody. So once you get that hustler mindset or that entrepreneur drive, you're always still going to have your baby, your company. So for me, I feel like I can partner with anybody. I love partnering with people, collaborating. But I still have to have something that I own as a legacy for my generation that's going to come behind me. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Now, in that same area, you seem to be a big advocate for the betterment of others, you know, a change agent uh, looking to help, you know, people long term. Uh, have you always had a passion for kind of helping, assisting others? Oh, absolutely. I, I um Always like to work with people. Always like to work with people. Even uh, my college roommate just came on. Hey, Keisha. Even when um, in high school, I would always be like a social butterfly. I'm always in the different social groups. In college, we always work with people. So it was natural for me professionally to work with people. I always used to help people. That's how I got into talent management. I didn't know anything about being a manager. They just said I could talk good and I can hustle. They were like, come on, be a manager. That's how I became a manager just because of how I walk, not because I really knew what I was doing. It's funny, almost everything I've fallen into, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew God gave me a purpose and the purpose was working with other people. I'm good at working with other people. Mm -hmm. Now, as a very powerful woman of color in this industry, what type of challenges have you faced just overall? Yeah, you said it just there, a woman of color. So a lot of people don't realize as many women of color you see, we don't have much power at all in this industry. Uh, we're usually always underneath somebody or another company. So it's very challenging because one, a lot of people we work with don't look like us or they're older than us. So there's a lot of ageism a little bit in a different way in this industry where people feel like, well, you're not old enough to direct me or lead me. So that was a big challenge for at least 10 years when I moved here. They just thought I wasn't seasoned. So they didn't care about the resume. They didn't care about none of that. And even now, I still find myself with that problem. I shoot normally in Georgia. So 90% of my crew, a lot of times, are white male from different backgrounds than me. I'm not from the South, so I don't talk and act like I'm from the South. Right. And that's an issue, too. Culturally, there's cultural differences. Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, and, and this doesn't go just for white and black. This is black on black. No, I agree. I agree. Northerners and Southerners operate and speak very differently. Yes. Yeah, so I've had a lot of challenges of learning how to relate to people in other parts of the country. So, for example, on a movie I did called The Sincere, starred Isaiah Washington in 2014. We shot that in Wilmington, North Carolina. That was the first time in that area people saw Black people that owned their own production company that were Black. They never saw Black. They, they see it on TV, but they never worked with or seen it in person. And I remember my assistant, I always hire somebody from the local cities because they know everything. Yes. And I remember always have her head down like this a little bit when she talked to white men. And I, it was so subtle, but I noticed it every time because I was taught you always go like this with your head. Right. Right? So I said something to her one time. I said, why do you always have your head down? 
And she goes, well, you know, it's, it's almost like respect. I said, well, respect is here. So even, and she was black. So even with my own people, we've had cultural clashes of just trying to push the envelope. That's a new era, it's a new time. We're not in 1850. Right. You can talk to somebody looking straight like this and be prepared to see us in co of color in charge. So yeah, so I have those challenges uh, being, um, of course, of color, being a woman, and then also not being traditionally from going to a film school. I didn't go to a film school. So I'm not what's considered a traditional filmmaker. Right. I'm somebody who's learned on the job. And some people have issues with that too. Um, but I, I feel like there's no rules in this game, as you know. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Whatever you want to be. Um, I feel there's room for everybody. And whatever's for me is going to be for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Okay. Well, there's a lot of going on in the world right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the entertainment industry is a, is a big part of our universe in terms of, you know, how we escape and what we do. Do you feel that entertainers uh, have an obligation to speak out or, or take action in this climate of social change uh, through, you know, maybe philanthropy or just using their voice or platform or even in the stories they write? Yeah, I do think we have a, a responsibility and I'm not even a celebrity, but I feel even having a platform, we have responsibility. And a lot of people disagree with this. And the reason why I say we have responsibility those very same people that are hurting are the ones who put you in your position. A lot of people don't realize this. You would not be a celebrity without us. Absolutely. A lot of people who thought they were celebrities and we have removed them from that position. Okay, you see, you don't, you don't hear nothing from Stacey Dash right now, right? She's off in the pasture. So we make you and we can break you. And I think you have a duty for people that patronize your business, for people that buy your sneakers, for people that go and spend their dollars at the theater, you have a duty also to make sure that they're living their best life in the sense that we have equality. So I definitely think we, everybody has a responsibility. I really do. If you ever collected a dollar from anybody in the black community, you need to make sure that it's fair and equal for all. Absolutely. I agree. I totally agree. All right. Now, as an attorney, uh, as well as, as, as a powerful woman of color, uh, what are your thoughts about the Breonna Taylor case? Um, it's obviously something that is still not really, you know, there's been not much movement on it in terms of what's going on. There's been a lot of conversation, but as far as I know, we haven't seen anyone brought to justice as of yet. And you can feel free to update me if I've got that incorrectly. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that the responsible parties will be brought to justice? Well, the good thing is the update today that the one main officer involved was fired. So, you know, that, so we, everybody's been able to see that letter from people Kentucky. So I think that starts the process. Um, a lot of people don't realize legally, these police unions are very powerful. Very. A lot of times, even when you see a police officer fired, and you think he's not getting his pension, and you think he's at home doing bad, a lot of times they're preparing to sue the very same organization that fired them, and they win. A lot of this stuff people don't understand politically. So I think what's going to happen is now we're starting to see the main one fired. I expect to see a trickle down of others fired. And then they can start the process with the DA of pressing charges. So I absolutely think we put enough pressure and people keep putting pressure that we are going to see some effect. But yeah, if you look it up, the main officer today was fired. That's the first process. They can't press charges against somebody who's still in the force. Right, right. So, Fortunately, there's going to be a lot of political red tape. And a lot of people don't realize these police unions, they're like the mob. I have two family members who are in the police force. They're like the mob. Wow. I've, I've always known that about police unions. As, as I've heard about reforms and things like that, one of the first things I thought about was, okay, now what are you going to do about the police unions that continue to put these uh, men and women back into the streets or, or continue to fight for them or continue to support them, even if they're not doing their jobs the correct way. Um, and that's a problem. And I know that that is a bigger fight to be oh, yeah. had because it is extremely well entrenched and politically backed. So it's, it's, it's an interesting, you know, uh, battle that's going to have to be fought, but one that's going to have to be. Um, how do you think that we should proceed in terms of those unions, especially since they're so powerful? 
I think the starting the campaign of defund the police, a lot of people got that campaign confused. It's not saying we don't need police anymore. It's just saying the funding needs to be appropriately um, put towards proper education to having even people on the streets who are medical professionals, like mental health. So when people say defund the police, they're basically like, we're not going to put billions of dollars into the system. It doesn't work. And so I think that starts with that. I think we need a new uh, commander in chief in office who can do some federal reform that will put pressure on the states because every state's going to be different. So this is going to be a long haul. This is not going to be short term at all, right? We both agree on that probably. Absolutely. And I, yeah, this is gonna have to be legislation. Supreme Court might have to get involved on some issues, real talk. And I think people don't really realize how entrenched the system of policing is in this country. And in hands up, when that comes out, you guys see it, you're gonna see how entrenched it is. Okay, there's always been police. They have just been called different things. And so I think this is going to be a long process. I think when they start getting to the point where we can actually sue a police officer for committing a heinous offense, people have to realize when a police officer kills somebody, even if it wasn't justified, doesn't mean you can sue him. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times they have these immunity laws around them that protect them from this. So that's why there's a lot of legislation happening that's important. Because I think when police feel their pensions at jeopardy, when police know that they can be personally sued. That part. Things are going <laughs> to... People don't understand that Derek Chauvin right now, even if he's found guilty of killing George Floyd. Oh, you're talking to... about the gentleman in uh, Minneapolis. I'm sorry, the gentleman, yeah, Minneapolis, uh, George Floyd, got you. He's still going to get his pension right now. They did a whole report on it last week because it's pro protected under the police union. They hold their pension for them until they turn 55. So a lot of times people don't realize that these police officers are still getting their pension, even if they killed somebody wrong. Wow. And so those type of laws need to be changed, that they can't get their pension, that the pension can be garnished to pay for reparations yeah. or um, restitution, not reparations, <laughs> restitution to the family. So these are the type of legal changes that have to happen to have a systemic effect on the police. Wow, that's, that's yeah, that's going to take some time. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and my hope is that we all continue as a people to keep putting pressure and continuing to do some things. And that kind of brings me to another question here. I've had conversations with different people. And so, you know what, let's talk to an attorney about this particular topic, especially one who is uh, well entrenched uh, into uh, legal as well as political affairs. Um, some people believe uh, that uh, voting uh, either does not work or has been ineffective or, you know, they're upset with, you know, the, the, the choices that have been made. They feel like either their vote doesn't count or that if they don't vote, you know, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. Your perspective in terms of voting and how important it is in this climate right now. Voting is really key. I was on a panel two weeks ago with my, my own people and a couple people did not do not believe in voting. They don't care. They don't trust Biden. They don't trust Trump. And I, and I feel that what people aren't understanding from a bigger, forget the bigger perspective that people fought, died and killed. Right. People, but say, forget that perspective. What you don't understand, not voting, you're still voting. Right. You're still voting. Yeah. So not voting is just as dangerous as voting for the wrong person. Right. Because basically you're leaving a slot there that somebody else can take. So regardless if you don't like Trump and you don't like Biden, you have to vote. And, and don't just write in a name. That's what happened four years ago. Just don't write in a name. Really look at your situation and say, who can I sit at the table with and have a conversation for change? And who's not even willing to sit at the table with me? Right. Because even if you don't like Biden, we can speak. Bring him and pull him out and call him to the table. If it's not even for going back to our former president, Obama, we can call Biden to the table and have a meeting and say, hey, make up for what you did in the 90s. Hey, help fix black families. A lot of them that got destroyed in the 90s for some of the bills that he was a part of. Right. Hey, let's have a conversation. We need change. We can't even do that with Trump. So it's not picking the lesser evil. It's just really seeing who can we have a conversation with who are you going to be potentially better with 
let me tell you something. Right now, people are making more money than ever made. Let's have this is this is going to tie into your topic. Whether it's from that extra six hundred dollars a week from unemployment, whether it's from these PPP loans, whether it's from these economic injury disaster loan grants, people are making money right now. You know who pushed that through? That was the Democrats in the House. Do your research and find that out. That's who it was. So even in this little moment. A lot of things that you benefited from in, during a crisis has been because you've had a democratic house. Mm. Gotcha. That $600 that's supposed to expire on July, uh, the end of July, uh, the Democrats have already submitted a proposal to extend it. So we have to look at things like that. Not saying the Democrats are all good because everybody has issues. Both sides have pros and cons. But just look to see where do you have a potential for more change. And so you have to vote in November. You have to have a vote. And on another note, if you are of color, you have to understand the history of voting. My parents were both a part of SNCC. Okay. People out here voting right now, they got on tennis sneakers. I mean, I'm voting, protesting right now, they got on tennis sneakers. They got on sweats. They got on t-shirts. You know what my parents and other people had on when they were protesting in the 60s? Skirts, dresses, hard top shoes for the men suits, slats, and getting chased by dogs, water hoses. That's what they did. So you right. could, and you out here protesting with tennis sneakers on. Come on now. Understand <laughs> what people went through. Right. No, no, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with you in terms of that. Go out there and definitely activate yourself into the process uh, if you have not already uh, in terms of that. Let's look at some people on the chat here. How you doing? I think we got somebody saying hi to you. Is that, is that Genesis uh, Pretty Gal? She's asking how we're doing. I know I'm doing great. Uh, it looks like Angela's doing fantastic over there as well. And it looks like we got a question as well. Um, uh, let's see. Why? Hold on. I got I got it. This looks interesting. Hold on. Why do y'all go by the book that the white man created and rearranged as the years went by? Um, I'm not sure as to what you're referencing. If you want to provide some more clarity on it, maybe we can address that. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, is that uh, Shalette Monet, uh, Monique? Uh, if I'm saying it wrong, I apologize. Thank you for joining uh, in terms of that. Hey, Trinity, uh, pretty gal. We appreciate you being on. In the Bible. Oh, he's, he's talking about the Bible. So... Uh, I, I guess he's has, I guess, make your question a little clearer there. So you're talking, I guess you've got some, some questions or something about the Bible. I'm going to ask Angela a few more questions and we'll, we'll, we'll try to circle back. Shifting the many gears of the world uh, that you have the opportunity to do, uh, what do you like to do for fun? How do you unwind and have a good time? Yeah, I definitely have a good time. I like to have a good dinner. I like company. I like to dance. I like to party just like the next person. I work hard and I party hard. Uh, for me, I'm in entertainment. So part of my job is to party. As strange as that sounds. You know, we have to network. We have to be around people. I love music. I love good concert. Uh, even during this pandemic, I was blessed to still be around people from here and there in a safe way. But yeah, I, I love just people. I love the entertainment. I love just going and traveling seeing other parts of the world. So I feel like when you work hard, you can relax hard too. Okay, okay. And, and, and speaking of the pandemic, how has that impacted you in terms of some things that you've learned about yourself or, or some adjustments you've had to make just personally? You know, what's some things you learned about yourself, you know, during this, this pandemic, this, this crisis that we all have been going through? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that you really have to have your house in order. Okay, so thank God I was not financially impacted or career impacted in the sense of I, I was in the middle of a TV show, so I had to stop shooting that, but I, I still had my own career that had nothing to do with that TV show, so I was able to continue in other aspects of my um, professional life. And um, thank God I had my finances in order, but what it was truly a wake-up call for people because people started mentally becoming depressed without going to the gym, without going to their job, with of course, without getting their check. So I think this is a reality check to make sure in the future to have at least money saved up. If you never had it before, you have to have multiple streams of revenue because if I relied just on the entertainment industry, I would have been really in trouble. 
really in trouble. So that was the wake up call for me. It's like, I really have to make sure my future's lined up because whatever you think can be taken away from you at any moment. And then how li precious life is. I had multiple family members with COVID. Thank God nobody passed away, but it was scary because this disease really attacked people of color. So that also let me know I have to have my health in order. So I normally am one that doesn't take pills, but I take now about eight pills a day, vitamins. And so now I'm like, okay, I got to get this together. I got to start working out, walking, doing something. Because uh, it, it really attacked, I think, people of color from sometimes our diet, not being as healthy. And so I, I'm even on my family now. Like, you have to work out. Even if it's just 30 minutes a day. Even just go walk and just do something. Because if anything, we don't want to lose life over the way we carry ourselves, right? Uh, so I think it was really a wake-up call. And then it was also lonely at times because you're stuck in a house and you really can't talk to people in the way you want to. Talking like this is cool, but sometimes you need that intimacy of other people, other vibrations. So I think that was a little difficult too. Thank God we all figured out ways how to be together but not be together. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. We, it we really, use... a lot of people were lonely. It didn't matter if you were in a house full of people. People were still lonely. How deep is that? Oh, very much so. Uh, I, I think that uh, it started before the pandemic uh, in terms of that. Uh, I think that uh, with all of the things that we have in place to keep us together, uh, they've actually distanced us even more. And I think that the pandemic really uh, turned the lights on in terms of that and actually showed us more so how distant we really have been. Hopefully, uh, the lesson was learned that you should make sure that you reconnect and connect with people who are in your circle and that you love, the people in your village. Uh, hopefully, that's the lesson a lot of people took. I know that I am taking it to heart. I think I've talked to my mother more now than I, I've talked to her in the past, not like I didn't talk to her anyway, but now it seems like we're, it's almost daily, uh, which probably should be the case anyway. Uh, with it. Mother, daughters, we on the phone all the time with our mothers. But even my <laughs> brothers like that. Sons aren't like that. They, they're like, oh, mom's okay. But Love my, and I'm a mama's boy. I'm an only child, so oh. I'm a mama's boy. Oh. Um, and I talk to her pretty, pretty regularly, but uh, I've noticed that uh, she, she's just been, I'll look up, oh, it's mom. And I'm picking up every time, like, hey, you know. But it, it's, I know that it's, it's something about, um, it's not, it's not by coincidence because usually she will call in a time where I, I could use that 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 motherly energy. So it's 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 great. I, I think I said I've seen and talked to her more, uh, and it's great uh, with it. So that's that's one of the lessons I took. Now you had mentioned this a little bit earlier about some of your projects and how they were impacted uh, in terms of that. Um, in lieu of that, what have you been doing in terms of quarantine foods? Now, we all, even though we're trying to work out and be healthy, but being at home, you're going to have an opportunity to, to definitely order some delicious dishes or make some delicious dishes, whatever the case may be. What's some of your favorite quarantine foods right now? Yeah, I gained about 15 pounds. I really have to get together very quickly uh, because normally I'm working all the time, so I, I'm rarely cooking. So I was making lobster and crab, macaroni and cheese, just because, oh, let me try to repeat this. I'm one that normally only has steak maybe once a month. I was at one point eating steak three times a week. I mean, just, just doing wild stuff, just in the house, just like, who? let me make it happen. So my favorite foods definitely have been the heavy foods, uh, heavy foods such as candy yams. I went mm -hmm. to a period where I was making a pie or cake every week to tempt something. So I tried the strawberry cake with fresh strawberries. And the next week I tried a peach cake. Then I made sweet potato pies for no reason. So it's funny how you revert back when you're stuck home to your childhood in the sense of being in the house during Christmas and Thanksgiving and you just cook it. That's what happened to me. Until really I got on the scale about a month ago and I was like, oh no, we're going to stop this. And that's when I started eating out. At first I, I didn't feel safe eating out. I didn't know if the people had Rona. I didn't know if they're going to bring it in the house. And so I was doing all the cooking for the first two months. So I just started eating out about a month ago as far as takeout with DoorDash. And then I just went to my first restaurant two and a half weeks ago. 
So I'm still a little nervous about eating out a lot just because you don't know if people have it. Uh, the cases, you're in Atlanta, so it's going up. The cases here in LA are going up. So we have to still be conscious. Very much so. I've been weird. Uh, for, and my wife cooks a lot, you know, at home anyway. But we, you know, we have our moments where we definitely go out and eat and, you know, order stuff as well. But obviously when this happened, we really bunkered in. And the, the moment that you that resonated with me, with what you just said is the holidays. Because yeah. around the, I, it did instantly put me in holiday mode. Because, you know, December. Yeah. Movies, everybody. Yeah. Like, I, well, yeah. and, and I work yeah, and I work virtually a lot anyway. So, you know, this was great for me to like, don't it's okay, just don't come in at all. I'm like, okay, great. And <laughs> so uh I, I'm in my sweats, you know, I'm catching up on my content. I mean, I'm still working, but you know, I I'm able to kind of work in my own universe and it felt like the holidays. Yeah. Um and, and I've been eating and enjoying it, but I'm a runner, so I, I would but I had to run in the neighborhood, you know, for say the last you know, a couple months. I just went back to the gym, say, last week. And then today I went again or whatever. I'm just, you know, going back. Yeah, I hate running outside. I, I need, I'm spoiled. I want to go to the gym in a nice air-conditioned room without people. How was <laughs> it? I'm still a little nervous about trying the gym. It's, well, at, with LA Fitness, and again, I can't speak for, for everyone. The one I go to, they did pretty well. And on top of that, I tend to go at odd hours where there's not a lot of people there, like two o'clock in the afternoon, there's no one in the gym, you know? So it wasn't a lot of people there, but they had everything separated and they checked your temperature and everything and you came in. So it was, I felt comfortable enough to kind of do what I had to do and, and roll out, uh, which is what I did today. But it resonated with me when you said the holidays, because that's exactly where I kind of defaulted to because it felt that way. It felt like, you know, it was December and the year's ending and your projects are kind of, you know, winding down or, or at least getting to the point where things are, you know, the industry kind of shuts down after a while anyway. So it felt exactly like that. Okay. So, and, and, and as we're kind of rounding third here, uh, we'll, we'll look at some people in the chat again, but what's the best piece of advice that you can give someone who's looking to make a career within the entertainment industry because you have a lot of different platforms, you have a lot of different ways in which you help people and kind of bridge that gap between, you know, uh, you know what they're doing then and, and kind of taking them to a different level. So what's the best piece of advice you can give someone that wants to try to make a career at this crazy thing called entertainment? The best piece of advice is research, research and educate yourself. So the mixture of the research is educating yourself. I find too many people enter the entertainment industry not having a clue. So think about it. You want to be a heart surgeon, you're going to go to school, right? Yeah. That's when you have to go to film school, but you're going to at least do the research to educate yourself. Yeah. And I feel you need to know what you're entering. It's not glitz and glamour. It's not whatever you think it is. It's a lot of hard work, long hours, and it's lonely. Nobody tells you that. Because if you're really successful in the entertainment industry, you're walking by yourself. Nobody's going to tell you this. Think of it. If you're an actor, nobody else can act with you when you're on set. You're doing it by yourself. So you have to really be prepared, have a good tribe around you, and be mentally fit to be in this industry. And I did that by interning with a lot of people. I um, assisted people. A lot of people don't know. I was Suzanne to pass assistant for like three, two and a half years at one point in the mid 2000s when I was doing the transition from talent managing to producing because I just wanted to be around somebody who was successful and see how they do it. So a lot of times you need to crawl before you walk. I worked for a lot of people. I didn't start producing on my own until the 2011. And I still was partnered with somebody. Right. Because it was so much to this industry and you need to have mentors, people that are going to show you and teach and they're not going to always teach you the way you want to be taught. That's a very good point. That's a very good point, yeah. Follow that pride. You really are. You're going to have to swallow the pride because I know when I first started, I had all these degrees, moved to L.A., and met nothing here. Everybody here got degrees. Degrees. So what? You got people in the mailroom at agencies here with a law degree from Harvard. Wow. Harvard. Real talk. So here, that doesn't mean anything. You're going to start at the bottom. 
You got to work your way up. You know, you're going to get your own form of hazing and you got to just suck it up and understand this is the business. People all over the world want to be in this business. This is the MBA. Think of it like that. There's millions of people over the world that want to be in this industry. And so you're going to have to dig in, dig deep, understand the industry you're getting into, have mentors, work with people and learn. I meet too many people, Al, that want to be Spike Lee day one. And they're not half a bit of Spike Lee. Yeah, it's a process. Spike Lee worked his butt off for you. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah, yeah it's a process. I, I remember when he was asking for, for money, you know, for, for uh, uh, getting Malcolm X you know, uh, made and everything like that, and trying to get investors for that. I, I remember those times. He was just asking for money on Kickstarter five years ago. You know how much of a reality check that was for me? Y'all don't remember when he was on, I think, Kickstarter Indiegogo like five years ago? Look it up. That was a reality check for me. Because I was like, wait a minute, Spike Lee's on these crowdfunding platforms looking for money.